Well, we're about to start the final, <clears throat> last but not least, session this afternoon. Final remarks. This, this is when people save the best till last. So be prepared for anything. In order of presentation on the stage, we shall start with Dr. Francesca Bastagli, who used to be a star pupil here at the LSE many years ago, wrote a brilliant, brilliant PhD thesis on Bolsa Familia, and has now been kidnapped by the Overseas Development Institute, where she works as a slave. I don't hear a disagreement there. Uh, and she's worked on um, numerous other research projects in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and that has, has advised many multilateral development organizations. Um, our second speaker will be another brilliant LSE alumnus, Dr. Indranil Chakrabarti, otherwise known as Duke. Makes life much easier. And um, he did some very interesting work on the Movimento do Sem Terra many years ago. And he's now uh, our man in Brasilia, representing DFID in Brasilia, having worked in uh, a number of other places beforehand, in Bangladesh, Zimbabwe, etc. And um, also for the Financial Services Authority. So he's got what you might call a very diverse background there. And our third speaker will be Dr. Lala Ben Barka, Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. My name is Anthony Hall, Professor of Social Policy here at the LSE. Uh, and finally, um, Minister Campello has offered to uh, give the concluding remarks by sort of doing a bit of a brief summary as it were, and um, ending this session. So um, we've got to be careful on the time. So I suspect probably 10 minutes for each speaker is about right. And um, I'll hand over to Francesca. Thank you, Tony. Well, first of all, it's a really a tremendous pleasure to be here and a great honor. Uh, this is a, a topic that is very dear to my heart, uh, even though I'm not Brazilian and I'm not a UK citizen either, so you might wonder why I'm actually Italian. But I, I owe a great debt to both countries. These are the two countries that on which I have dedicated most of my, my work and research. Um, uh, mainly on Brazil, but also in the UK. Uh, so I, I am indebted to both countries. And the idea to, of trying to uncover and identify what the areas for stronger exchange and collaboration between the two countries might be is one that, that clearly uh, that appeals to me very much. And indeed, the focus of my uh, brief uh, comments here will be on identifying some of these areas. Now, obviously, there's a whole range of potential areas um, on which there could be increased and strengthened collaboration across these two countries. Um, an obvious example which has been already mentioned is around uh, in the international development context, and I believe some other panelists will be, will be touching upon that. So what I'm going to primarily concentrate on is the issue of social policy, which is my area of work, and speci specifically social protection policy, so both social assistance but also social insurance type policy, and to think about um, what types of, there are two main areas I think in which there could be strength in collaboration, but also what some of the examples of the actual topics for, for additional collaboration might be. Now obviously the two countries are tremendously different, so um, I think that's rather evident. Uh, on the other hand, they also have some commonalities, uh, and I'm thinking particularly around the question of social policy and social protection. There are some common challenges that both are facing, particularly if we look if we look, take a sort of forward-looking approach. And I think that the differences between the two countries and at the same time these common issues that they're facing 
are uh, a strength and, and strengthen the motivation for arguing for increased collaboration and exchange between the two countries. So on the one hand, we have the UK with a very uh, old tradition, welfare state tradition that Sandra touched upon earlier, of course, beverage, uh, one of the founding fathers of the welfare state. Brazil has a more recent tradition, uh, although there too, certainly when it comes to social insurance and social security, Brazil has a fairly extensive tradition. And over recent decades, it has made tremendous, uh, taken tremendous steps forward in the uh, establishment and expansion of social assistance programs. And we, of course, most of you will have followed uh, the minister's presentation on the Bolsa Familia, the reform, and the extent of the impacts, very impressive impacts that the Bolsa Familia reform more broadly has brought about. Um, so it seems to me that on the one hand, UK, the UK's very strong tradition welfare provision um, is, is an asset in terms of allowing Brazil potentially to learn from some of the key challenges that it's, fa that it's facing and understanding how, what the options are in, in tackling some of these issues. At the same time, some of the more recent reforms, particularly over the last decade, that have taken place in Brazil uh, are a learning ground uh, and has yielded very important policy implications uh, for countries worldwide, including the UK, and I'll, and I'll provide some very specific examples on where this is the case. So in many ways, the recent reforms we've seen in Brazil, the innovation that, these have, that this has brought um, is, is an area that, that could be exploited for additional um, collaboration and exchange with the, with the UK. I think sort of if we stick to the example of Bolsa Familia, but, but in some sense of social assistance reform in Brazil more broadly, uh, one of the, the key defining features of the Brazilian experience over the past 10 years, 10 or 12 years, has been a, a key driving underlying principle of promoting universal access to services. And, and the minister emphasized this, I think, very clearly. And, and this, this strong motivation, this strong value that underpins the social assistance reforms in Brazil, beyond the Bolsa Familia, I mean, including Bolsa Familia, but also beyond that, um, has had a number of very important implications for, for the Bolsa Familia design itself. Uh, and again, the earlier presentation by the minister touched upon a number of Bolsa Familia design parameters uh, that make it so effective, including its simplicity, which is not a minor uh, issue, and we can look at why that's so important. But there are other aspects around the way the conditionalities are designed, around the accompanying measures that have permitted the expansion of this, not only the Bus Familia, but also uh, other accompanying measures across a very diverse country. All these uh, initiatives essentially uh, incorporate and reflect a very strong preoccupation for inclusion and promoting citizenship and entitlement. Now this is very different from what you find in most other countries. I have to say, and I say this as a student and, and researcher in countries um, worldwide, including the UK, and a student of social policy in the UK, the, 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 the principal ins driving inspiration of the Bosa Familia and social assistance reform in, in Brazil has, has had very defining um, impacts on the design of policy. Now, more specifically, uh, and these matter. These matter because we've seen some, you know, some very impressive results. But one of the questions is, how do you get to those results? And there are very detailed design parameters of the Bosa Familia that have enabled these results to, to, to be achieved. And the truth is that when you look at the existing evidence, we have, you know, there's quite a uh, large amount of evidence around the impacts. The evidence around the institutional design and implementation details that have facilitated these, these impacts uh, is still somewhat um, limited, or anyway, could be much more developed and exploited in order to, to promote cross-country learning and sharing. And one example, an obvious example, is around conditionality. Conditionality in social assistance and social policy is no, nothing new in the UK, and in fact we see um, also in recent years um, reforms around conditionalities, behavioral requirements for beneficiaries that are uh, that are um, applying for social assistance. In this area, for instance, Brazil has evolved and developed uh, um, an understanding of conditionality that is very different from anything you find elsewhere. So in the case of the Bolsa Familia, for instance, there are conditions uh, that are 
that are defined around the behavior of beneficiaries that are required to send their children to school and to, and to um, visit healthcare centers on a regular basis. But in contrast with what you find in, in frankly, all other countries, uh, beyond this definition, the focus of the, of the conditionality is entirely around the service provider and the role of the state in ensuring that households, that poor, vulnerable households, are in the position to, to indeed comply with these conditionalities, which are understood, in fact, as a, as a vehicle for accessing basic services and, and, and entitlements. And in practice, what this means, for instance, is that non-compliance, so in the case of a household that does not comply with these behavioral requirements, uh, this is viewed as a, as, a, as a flag of extra or additional vulnerability, and these households are entitled to additional support. So in contrast with the understanding of conditionality in most under con other countries, including the country we are in now, where non-compliance is understood in a much more sanctionary, punitive way, um, we see in Brazil, a, 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 frankly, an entirely different understanding of conditionality. And this is just one example of the many ways in which the Bolsa Familia and other, also perhaps larger reforms, incorporate this central preoccupation towards including those that have been excluded so far and that continue to be excluded, and in promoting citizenship and entitlement. And there are a number of examples, there are more, I could go on for a long time, there's, there's an indicator, for instance, is very fascinating and probably understudied. Again, uh, the, the Indice de Gestao Decentralizada, an indicator that is used to, um, to monitor uh, and, and, and promote also effort uh, in, the, um, in the administration of the Bolsa Familia at the local level, uh, but that takes into account, so it, it has a, a, a sort of performance rewarding element to it, but it also um, reflects a need, variations in need and capacity at the local level. And again, this is an instrument that is not spoken much of, of, of certainly in circles in the UK, but that has had, a, that is having a tremendous impact in terms of allowing the Bolsa Familia to expand in a way that it does not allow uh, the poorest regions and the poorest municipalities to fall further behind, but in fact allows them to, uh, and provides them with the support that is required to expand administrative capacity. Linked to this, of course, if we look then just turning back at the UK in some sense, the UK at the same time also has a very strong tradition in, of course, in social assistance and in linking social assistance provision with services. Uh, so here, for instance, there's fertile grounds, it seems to me, to um, promote exchange and, and lesson learning across this experience. Um, other issues that are, it seems to me, uh, rather pressing that haven't been mentioned today, uh, but, but that again both countries are facing has to do with, with pensions um, and, and the population aging. So this is something where the UK has been facing this critical issue now for a while and has already, been, has already launched a number of reforms. In Brazil, uh, Brazil is, the Brazilian population is aging very rapidly. Uh, and again, when we talk about pensions, so looking beyond social assistance, but consider social insurance, which actually is a much higher share of public spending in Brazil, and, and frankly, a, 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 is a rather peculiar characteristic of the Brazilian um, social security system. There, there, there is a mounting pressure to uh, promote reform also in this sector, and this is an area, again, where be across the two countries there is room for exchange. Uh, and finally, just as a third example, the question of promoting universal <laughs> service provision and access and quality. Of course, we've seen again in, in today's earlier presentation by the minister, very good, um, very impressive results in terms of uh, improved access to education, access and use of education services, health services, and this is a, a tremendous achievement. Um, there have been improvements also in terms of outcomes uh, and again, we saw some data on that, but much more needs to be done in terms of ensuring the quality of education and health uh, service provision. And this is something that, that um, is particularly important, A, because this is what in practice determines the outcomes of you know, people's outcomes. So they need to, people need to not only attend school, but need to learn and have a good grasp of, of, of the skills that need to be acquired. Um, but also because at the end of the day, if we are aiming, if if the objective is to promote 
universal access to services and universal use to services that are of a similar quality, then we have to ensure that these services are of equal quality across the country. And in both countries, we have seen, to some degree and to varying degree, um, a risk that that you know, what are in, on paper sort of universal services may be, may be partly splitting out into services that are primarily privately provided that the higher income or higher wealth groups are accessing and um, public services that are those that are primarily accessed by lower income groups. And this is a major concern, uh, as most of you know, and, and ideally the, the development of a two-tier system can be very problematic precisely on grounds of universalism and entitlement. As, as Amartya Sen has written, uh, for instance, we know well that, that uh, public services for the poor are poor services. Moving on and, and concluding, um, I think beyond the policy learning potential and policy exchange, perhaps rather than learning, uh, there is tremendous scope also to share in terms of research methods and, and analytical work. Uh, and here I, I feel very strongly, I think the UK has one of the strongest and perhaps exclusive tradition in social policy studies. It's a discipline that you do not find in most other countries. If you go to the US, uh, for instance, US universities will typically do not have social policy departments. They, you will find public policy departments, you will find social work departments, but social policy as we understand it and as perhaps the way I'm describing it now, so to include all of government policy aimed at, uh, at providing uh, support to people over the course of the lifetime, but also providing support to vulnerable groups and, and fighting inequality and promoting redistribution. This is something that, that is traditionally very um, strong in the UK. Uh, so here I have to say there, there's, I think, tremendous scope to try and establish stronger links with Brazilian researchers and academics and practitioners working in social policy in Brazil where to some extent, of course, a there's a lot of research already going on and, and there are some absolutely superb um, researchers carrying out this work. But at the same time, there still is a weaker tradition in social policy analysis. Uh, and here I think there are some research institutions and organizations, including some based at the LSE, that could, that could usefully um, establish an exchange with, with researchers in, in Brazil. And the reason why I, I mention this is not only a, of a methodological nature, but also in terms of the types of topics studied. Because, for instance, in Brazil, while we have a, a strong understanding of the distribution of public spending, and we saw a lot of the figures that we saw, saw today, basically we're looking at the, the incidence and, and distributional impact of the Bolsa Familia, so of public cash transfers, and we see they're very positive impact in reducing inequality. There are some areas of, of social policy and public policy in Brazil that we know much less about. Uh, and for instance, around taxation, uh, for instance, around the distribution of wealth. Uh, and these are areas where, again, the, we do have some information, but there could be much more, much more could be done, and much more, I think, needs to be done in terms of regular monitoring and regular analysis. So it's, it's wonderful to see that, you know, that public spending is certainly, when it comes to cash transfers in Brazil, they're, they're, they're progressive in their distribution. Uh, but we also want to know more about where the funds for these, for these transfers are coming from and what the incidence and impact of taxation is. Uh, these are areas, again, where in the UK, for instance, the UK, there are independent research organizations that on a regular basis monitor and publish information on inequality, on the impact of taxes and transfers, um, as well as other in-kind transfers, and provide this information to the public and to politicians, and are therefore contributing on a regular basis to political debate. And here, perhaps, um, again, this could be strengthened in Brazil. Um, so really this was my main message, that there, there are, there's a plenty of opportunity to strengthen exchange both in terms of policy practice and lesson learning and in terms of um, analytical approaches. Thank you. Right, uh, thanks very much, Francesca, for a very succinct and very pointed exposition from which I hope we'll all learn some lessons. Okay, um, 
Our next on the list is Indranil. If you'd like to take the stage. Mr. Campello, fellow panellists, ladies and gentlemen, my, my old professor, Tony Hall, um, I'd like to say how much I've enjoyed the event today. And I'd like to thank Sandra, Jacqueline, the people from Afro Reggae and Kufa for contributing towards this work, which makes a very important contribution to the study of urban, low-income communities. I would also like to appreciate the role of UNESCO and Itau for their support to this research. Um, Professor Anthony Hall mentioned um, a thesis I wrote many years ago on the Saint Terra, and that reminded me of perhaps one of my more embarrassing moments as a student. It's a small anecdote um, which I should share with you. Um, Tony very, very kindly agreed to provide some comments on the thesis, um, though I was submitting it to a different department at the LSE. In my rush to get the thesis finished and sent to him, I stayed up all night, as you do as a student, writing it. I rushed to the post office, and I posted the thesis to Tony's house. What I didn't do was put any stamps on the letter. <laughs> and so Tony's very kind, very polite. He handed back the thesis to me a couple of days later. He didn't say that I, ha that I hadn't uh, put any stamps on, but the post office had put all on the front envelope, basically, a fine to the recipient, who was Tony. So not, Tony not only provided comments out of his own goodwill, he also paid a, a fine for me for a thesis that I sent him for comments on. As I said, one of the more embarrassing moments as a student, but Tony's probably forgotten about that. Thank you, anyway. Particular thanks to Minister Teresa Campello for her contributions today. The work of her ministry in the Brazilian government is nothing short of remarkable and represents to all of us a shining example that the lives of poor people can be improved and poverty can be reduced at scale with the right policies and the requisite political will. Nothing encapsulates this better than the slogan you see all around Brazil today. Brazil, país rico é país sem pobreza. A rich country is a country without poverty. It is for this reason that at the FID we are very proud of our history of close working with the Ministry of Social Development in Brazil. And we are pleased at the evolution of a partnership with Brazil from one as bilateral donor to that of equal partner, working with Brazil and with Brazilian institutions to share knowledge and expertise of reducing poverty with other low-income countries, mainly in Africa. The book Underground Sociabilities I first received about a year ago from our ambassador in Brazil. I was really keen to read it as I have an enduring interest in how the urban poor are so integral to the functioning of our major cities, yet seen to them, seen as marginal to them and often denied their rights as full and equal citizens. I had just returned when I read the book from a number of visits to Complexo do Alemão in Rio and saw for myself how simple improvements in the urban environment, in the case of Alemão, the cable car system, stations which actually provided useful services for the local community, like creches, could make such a huge difference in the lives of local inhabitants. The visit to Alemão and previously time I spent living in the favela de Vigigal, also in Rio, and doing my doctoral research in two low-income settlements in Calcutta, reinforced to me the basic premise of Janet Perlman's seminal book, The Myth of Marginality, Urban Poverty and Politics in Rio de Janeiro, which was published in 1976. Between 1968 and 1969, Janice Perlman, a young American researcher, lived in the favelas of Brazil's marvelous city, Rio de Janeiro. Her research criticized the well-accepted attitude of assigning to the urban poor responsibility for their alleged lack of integration into the city's job market. One of its key arguments was to point out the absurdity of blaming the victims for their own poverty. Perl Perlman found that the favelados, and I quote, are not marginal, 
but inexorably integrated into society, albeit in a manner detrimental to their own interests. The myth of marginality radically challenged the negative views of the urban poor that were prevalent at the time, and I should add, are still prevalent today. Underground sociabilities, I think, fits in within a trend of scholarly thought that emerged in the mid-1960s, from writers such as Anibal Quijano, Manuel Castells, Floristan Fernandez, William Manguin, through Perlman, through to the vision of, of people like Mayor Peñalosa, who was the mayor of Bogota. It shows quite clearly how, underground sociability shows quite clearly how favela dwellers inhabit a segregated world, marginalized from the rest of the city, whilst at the same time highlighting how the vast majority of people living there are hardworking, determined, and brave, and surviving on their social capital. Perlman's return to Rio 40 years later revealed the extent to which conflicts for favela communities were less in relation to the state and more in relation to the crim crime, criminal-led violence which now pervades favela life. None of this should be surprising to any of us here. Where the state leaves a vacuum, alternative forces will fill that vacuum. Nowhere is this more starkly present, presented than in the words of the respondents in the underground sociability study. As a counterbalance to the uncertainty, danger, and insecurity of favela life, the book pr brilliantly illustrates the role of community-based organizations like Kufa and Afro Reggae that provide such an important social support for particularly young favela dwellers. I hope the work, this work, underground sociabilities can lead to real changes in public policy that will result in maximizing the potential, culture, and commitment of favelas and their communities, thereby further eroding the myth of marginality and contributing to a brighter, more inclusive future for the marvelous city of Rio de Janeiro. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Duke, for uh, another inspiring talk. You notice how concise yet pointed these observations are, getting right to the point. Good. Excellent. LSE style. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure about that, but still. Um, now, for our third, our third speaker in this session, I have to apologize because I gave you the wrong name before. The existing uh, speaker on the program is substituted by Dr. Dendev Badak, who is um, Assistant Director, Deputy Assistant Director of the Division of Social Transformation and uh, Intercultural Dialogue at the United Uni UNESCO. I hope I've got that right. So, uh, welcome. Hey, colleagues. This, this seminar is the fourth seminar for me in my capacity of the director of the division of uh, <coughs> social transformation and intercultural dialogue in the UNESCO uh, social and human science sector. Uh, it was very inspiring seminar for me. And so <coughs> first taken to this opportunity, I would like to thank the government of Brazil and uh, the Secretary of State for, <clears throat> for their leadership and you know, fighting in extreme poverty and successful implementation of the government program, Bolsa Family. My thanks also goes, go to the representatives of the NGO grassroots organizations for their enriching debate and innovative approaches. I would like also thank the organizers of this initiative, LDC, Professor Georgievich, for excellent cooperation with UNESCO. <clears throat> you know the UNESCO LDC joint underground sociability project is a tangible proof of UNESCO's capacity to act as a catalyst for international cooperation 
building bridges between stakeholders from across the spectrum on the topic of capital importance, namely promotion of research and policy in favor of social inclusion. We saw today's, during this, today's debate that there is the great potential for innovative responses to persistent problems and challenges through the building of multi-stakeholder initiatives that combine the rigors of renewed academic institutions like LSE with the insight and knowledge of grassroots organizations. Also, it is important to invest in North-South and South-South dialogue on the issue of further promoting research policy nexus, promoting social inclusion. It is also clear that we would need to pursue the organization of similar policy dialogue and the advocacy events to stimulate further reflections on the approach promoted through this project and especially on how it could be replicated and further refined. I wish you all safe trip to home and we are looking forward to welcoming some of you in UNESCO headquarters in Paris on this coming Monday, 17th of November, where we will have a similar event to be held. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed for those useful words. And um, it now leads me to invite Minister Campello, whom you're all familiar with, to say a final, few, a final few words in this panel. Good evening to all of you. It's already very dark, although it's only 5.20. <laughs> As I said, I spoke a lot today, so I'll try and be a lot more brief to reach the 10 minutes and try and uh, contain uh, my what I have with you. I will talk about four very brief questions. I would like to first of all mention that as a Brazilian listening, people talking about Bolsa Familia, I get very emotional, but today speaking, Francesca speak, I was so impressed how she managed to capture an issue which seems like a small nuance that few people really understand that, in fact, I am very conv convinced of one thing. Income transfer must be associated to conditionalities. This was a debate that we did when we started to create Bolsa Familia, and very many people were against it, that you just had to give income. But we had a number of uh, polemics, and this was one of them. And we decided to have a program which, so, with some conditionalities and the results that we have seen with regard to education and health are enough to show that far more important than to just get rid of poverty is the role of Bolsa Familia in transforming the life of children. Nothing can be more important than make sure that children are eating at school. And so this debate we've, we've managed to resolve. But more and more for us, it becomes clear, and this is very important because it's not very well understood by people who debate income transfer uh, with conditionalities, that we are not just talking about exchange. I will give you money so long as you take your children to school, because normally that's how people see things. I'll give you. Uh, money. What is your du duty? I'm give, I've done my bit. I've given you money. So you have to take the children to school. And it seems like the adult has to pay both the family by taking their children to school. I think it's a very simple way to try and convince people who are not specialists in public policies. But strictly speaking, that's not what we're talking about when we give the state the responsibility of social inclusion for us, 
when we to say we'll give both a family and we want children in school, we also want to have information whether this child is going to school because nothing shows more that this family has more problem than if this child is not going to school. So not taking a child to school is not a question of an information, so I'll stop paying them. This has to be read as this is a very important information if the state wants to act. If the child is not going to school, there are a number of things that may be happening. Perhaps it, the child is a victim of violence. Perhaps it, her mother is a victim of violence. Perhaps she is working. Perhaps the family is having a serious health problem and the child is not doesn't have transport for school. It, this is showing us not that the family is worthless and lazy and doesn't want to take the child to school. That's usually how people read. They are time wasters. They're not doing their duty. That's not the meaning, that, the significance that we need to get out of this. It can happen to poor and rich people, people being lenient with their children. This is not the tradition with, for a poor population to be lenient with their children. Usually what we see in communities is solidarity, even with other people's children, not just with your own. So I think we have to see this. I have an information. I gave money to this uh, family. The child should be at school. I have a very important asset, information. So what are we going to do? We're developing and changing. We changed last year one of both of our so We cannot stop giving Bolsa Familia to a family unless the social worker goes and visits the family. If the child doesn't go to school, she receives her, she was notified. She didn't go again after two months. We stopped providing Bolsa Familia. And what if this child is a victim of violence? What if she's threatened by something? So we stop the money. So, but we'll only take them out of Borsa Familia if the social worker goes there so we can see what's happening with that family. We need to see this family because we want to bring it within the social system. The whole point of an uh, income transfer program and the great novelty is because it's a channel, a channel it may be uh, an income channel, but for a state, who wants to have a real social protection network who reaches those more, more vulnerable people and who have more difficulties than anybody else. Even uh, accessing this public network. So I think this is a very important point. I thank very much and all the generous words and the ability to be talk about this. I would also like to go back to one of the um, issues that was brought up, I don't even know if she's present here, about the division of Brazil during the election periods. Unfortunately, the debate about income transfer policy came back and became a new polemic. But we have a very recent research where 18,000 people were asked. And for our surprise, most Brazilians, do you agree with Bolsa Familia? 75% of Brazilians said yes, they do agree, which I think it's a very uh, important uh, accept, uh, accepting um, figure. Yes, I do agree that there should be an income transfer program. But I don't think it shouldn't be just that. And I believe that that's the case, too. And I believe that everybody thinks that that's not enough. But I think there was an important discussion in the social media because there was a lot of prejudice against poor people. And I think it's an opportunity for us to face these conservative sectors who are prejudiced, who were hidden before. They came out of their cupboards during the electoral process. And I think this is an opportunity that we as Brazilians and world citizens to discuss inclusion. And I know that today there was a research that came out here in yesterday in the, in the UK also dealing with this topic. And I think it's an old topic, the old saying, a Confucian saying, and I don't think we can go further back than Confucius, that we don't have to, we can't give the fish, we have to uh, learn them how to fish. 
this is comes back again and again. And I think we have to do everything. We have to give the fish. We have to give them show them where the river is. Teach them how to fish. Everything is important. We can't think that people can die and the population has to die. We also have the duty to teach them how to fish, but we also need to give them the fish. So I think it's the responsibility of the state. It needs to be there. And I think it's the great teaching and something that we have to build together. Thank you very much. Okay, I think if we, if we stretch it, we can um, have time for a couple of questions from the floor if there are some really pressing issues that you'd like addressed. Now is your opportunity. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> um, person at the back. Uh, hi, my name is Andre Pisa. I'm from People's Palace Projects at Queen Mary University. I'm Brazilian, so I'd prefer to uh, make the question in Portuguese uh, for the Secretary of State. Um, Good evening, Secretary of State. Very interesting ex words, and I want to ask you about some news we have seen on the media after the elections. It was very common in the conservative press about some evidence that social inequality was not decreasing anymore. So it was stagnating, flattening. And I, they didn't really clarify. Um, the news was not explained with few perspectives on this news. And I didn't see a reaction by the government and counter arguments. So I just want to know how the government responded to that and what you could say to us about this. Thank you very much. It's a very long discussion, but I'll try to summarize my reply. What happened there? We have research that the go Brazilian government, they have a research institute. They have a very large sample with transparent numbers, micro data about poverty, but also all the features that we have shown here. So with 400,000 people every year, and these data, they are made available, they are make av made available every year. Any researcher in Brazil or from elsewhere, they can check. Uh, the IBGE website and they can check this information. So we see two issues. First of all, the Gini rate, because we have a Gini rate. Um, when we get numbers very close, the Gini index, when we get rumors like light for all that program, the electricity one, is almost universal. So everyone, more and more, we have to take electricity also. The curve starts flattening in with decreasing rates in this Gini index. So we are reducing poverty as well. So you reach a stage where the rates of decrease, they are harder to be transformed and moved. So three to four years, we have a rate in the Gini index, which is a income rate indicator not so sensible to our programs because it looks upon just income in a certain specific way. So we have also some rates that they don't capture anything. I talk about the rainwater. So none of our rates, they talk about this one million um, tanks that we had to capture rainfall. So when we talk about income as well, 
the, the poor people, they don't, they, they are exempted from paying taxes. So we couldn't really capture that data based on income, personal income. So what we have seen in the last IBGE research, the level of poverty are not decreasing so much. So you have a tendency of decrease in 12 years. Then we have one point in the curve that may be a fluctuation. I think it's a fluctuation because we have features in the economy that were very strong. They should have reduced the rate, but it didn't. Therefore, we cannot be um, very uh, specific about one point in the curve in relation to the all interventions we have been doing. Now we've just had the elections. Um, we have this effect, this hangover, so everyone is kind of contaminated by that. But all the data are there, all the data are there, and everyone can access it. Thank you very much. This seems like an appropriate time with the minister's uh, final declaration to round things off. Um, on behalf of the conference organizers, Sandra and company, who put in so much hard work to get together uh, and bring off what I think has been a very successful workshop today, um, thank everyone. And most of all, thank you all for coming and participating so conscientiously in this uh, series of debates today. And let's hope this isn't the last of them, but we'll see many more. Oh, yes, okay. I'm told we've got some drinks downstairs. In the senior common room, which is on floor five, we're on six, so downstairs, um, that's where the party is afterwards. Okay, so we hope to see you all there. Yes, right. <laughs> we hope you can all join us for some drinks.